I'm going to welcome to, uh, Dr. Tony Bates to our class. Tony, thank you for coming today, and uh, I'd like to turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Owen, um, and thank you everybody for finding the time today. Um, the, what I plan to do today is really uh, to turn a lot of the things back to you, to you, the um, the students on this course, because in many ways you're going to be closer to many of these issues than I am. Uh, I'm towards the end of my career, and uh, I'm not engaged as you are um, in the front lines these days. So I think your contribution to this discussion is going to be as important, if not more important, than what I've got to say. But uh, I'm going to try and frame uh, the questions in, in terms of what uh, we know and in terms of what we don't know as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll move into the presentation. And I built it around the three questions that we have. Uh, can higher education institutions return to how things were before uh, COVID-19? And if not, how can higher education institutions set themselves up for success? Well, I don't think they can go back to way, the way things were before COVID-19, um, partly because we're gonna have COVID-19 or its implications uh, hanging around for quite a long time. Uh, even if we get a vaccine in a year or a year and a half, uh, things will be different. Um, and let's look at how some of that will happen in terms of online learning. Now, the first thing I would say is that anybody who tries to predict the future is, is, is stupid uh, because we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, but nevertheless, I came out, went out on a limb and said, this is what I think will happen to online um, blended learning enrollments as a result of COVID-19. You'll see that up until 2000, uh, the red line is fully online. And we were releasing fairly steady rate at about 10% per annum of number of online enrollments, fully online, distance online enrollments. Um, about 10% of all online of all courses were online in Canadian universities in 2018 and I expect that to get a bit of a boost obviously because everybody's gone online this year but in 2021 it'll settle down again slightly higher than it is at the moment and it will continue to grow slowly because uh, for two reasons demographics that there are less students coming out of high school at the moment and institutions will need to keep their numbers up just for the uh, financial reasons of keeping their tuition fees in, in, in going. And the, um, there will be increasing demand for online learning from lifelong learners, people out in the workforce who need to continue to uh, qualify and get new, new knowledge in order to keep their jobs and so on. So I expect it to flatten out to around about 25, 20, 25% of all courses will be fully online, maybe in 10 years time. But the really interesting change I think is gonna happen on campus. Um, I don't think we'll go back to the situation where we had very little online learning being used on campus. Uh, you, again, you'll see that slightly more classes were blended than fully online in 2020. But I think many instructors will, uh, first of all, some have found that going online has been great and they want to continue to do that. All right. I don't think many will find that, but I think many who hadn't done it before, there will be some who will want to do that. But much more likely, uh, many, many instructors will find that there are elements of online learning that are very useful. Uh, for instance, students going off and doing their own work online and coming back with that work into class. So I see the blended, uh, blended and hybrid learning particularly increasing very quickly after um, 2020, after 2021. And eventually I think that nearly all courses in certainly in post-secondary education will be a combination of uh, either fully online or blended and hybrid learning. And the other thing that's going to happen, and we've seen, we've seen that already, um, University of Calgary already advertised this year, despite the fact they're getting cut quite heavily by the Alberta government, they advertised for 10 new instructional designers this year. 
So many institutions realize they're gonna to have to increase their support staff. And if you're Mallet students, that must be very good news for you. Because it looks like the job market for people with your qualifications is gonna be pretty strong over the next few years. So that's the good news, I guess. But there are some policy issues that come out of that. I think COVID-19 is actually just speeding up the inevitable. These things would have happened, but probably more slowly without COVID-19. The second thing is, I think that every institution, every school, every school board, every university and college needs a plan for um, and a set of strategies for how it's going to handle digital learning. If this is going to become a critical part of all teaching, then how do we make sure we do it well? Um, and how are we going to move to that? How are we going to support our instructors to get there and our students to get there. And so I think every institution will need a plan and it might, no, many Canadian universities already have a plan. About uh, two thirds either have a plan or are developing one for digital learning. But uh, they're probably going to have to accelerate those plans or they're going to have to be a lot less conservative in what they're trying to do. And um, for instance, I see some institutions now setting targets of where they want to be in. Uh, two or three years and what combination of online and uh, blended learning they want to see across their institution. And the second probably more important reason actually than COVID-19 is what's going on in the economy outside. Um, we're seeing uh, a lot of changes and this is a topic of a really for a full lecture and so on, but we're seeing much more emphasis on skills development, particularly high level intellectual skills development. And those skills uh, people will need because uh, the job market is going to be very volatile. Um, jobs will come and go and people will need to move from one job to another fairly seamlessly. And they're going to need these very high level skills that they can carry from one job to another. But the other good news for instructors, I guess, um, and teachers is that developing high level skills is pretty labor intensive. You need lots of practice to develop a skill, uh, but you, so you need lots of uh, opportunities to practice, but also you need high quality feedback. And that can't be scaled up too, too much through things like artificial intelligence. Um, you can scale up other areas of teaching like content delivery and testing through artificial intelligence. You perhaps replace some of that to free up uh, teachers time to focus on the more high level intellectual skills development and the feedback that students need and the assessment that they need to develop those skills. But I also think the change will be slow because most university instructors are not trained for such a shift. And I'm not even sure many school teachers are trained for, for that, although I'm less certain about that. So faculty development and training will become even more important uh, in the future. And that's why court programs like MALAT will be uh, even more important. And I think what we need to see actually is uh, several more programs like this, particularly on in central and uh, eastern Canada. Um, at the moment, most of the, there's the MET program at UBC, there's the MALAT program, there's something out of Lethbridge, so there's plenty of stuff on the west coast, west, west, western Canada, but less less uh, faculty development uh, programs and, and uh, educational technology programs in the rest of Canada. So I, I think we'll see uh, a need for at least some more of the uh, programs like Malay. So what I see is a slow but gradual change in pedagogy from content presentation to high level skills development. But as I said, this is a big challenge and we don't have a faculty development model actually that's working very well. Less than 10% of faculty in a university will take any faculty development program in any one year. And it's often the same faculty that take them. And it's often the ones who lead it, need it the, the, uh, the least. They're the, often the best teachers who actually take these programs. So what I see happening is uh, an increase in certificates in digital teaching and learning particularly in f form of open access programs. I'm very interested in Lethbridge College's open uh, program. That's been very, very popular uh, on, on teaching digitally. 
I see some institutions or even governments mandating uh, compulsory uh, uh, faculty development, ongoing faculty development, and probably teacher uh, uh, training as well. And maybe even some earmark government funding. If I was the federal government and was looking to boost productivity and get the economy working, well, one way where place I'd put it would be in uh, ensuring that our teachers are um, geared up for developing the knowledge and skills that students need in the 21st century. Um, and increasingly, I see online training resources on demand. I think people who are instructional designers are going to have to walk the talk by creating open access, uh, easily available, on demand resources for instructors when they need it. Uh, one example is um, at the University of British Columbia, they have a very good uh, website on how to do a good educational video. And each of the steps uh, is linked to the research that uh, is the basis for making the recommendations that they're making. And so if you want to make a video, you can just go online, it's open access, it's OER, you can go in and access that. I, and I think we need to see a lot more of that type because we just can't scale up the kind of face-to-face -face faculty development that's the, the traditional model today. So I'm going to stop and ask you to, for your thoughts on this. You're, you're in the middle of all this. so. Can higher education institutions return to how things were before COVID-19? And if not, how can higher education institutions set themselves up for success? And Erwin, if you can moderate this discussion, we'll have about five minutes and then we'll move on to the next question. Okay, thanks for that, Tony, and happy to do that. So uh, the floor is open for questions and comments. Um, fire away. Hi, Kathy. Thank you so much, Tony, for your, your thoughts. Um, I agree wholeheartedly that um, it's an issue of should we be going back to where it was before COVID-19 and and how to do that does involve a certain degree of, of new thinking for many teachers who have been doing the same thing year after year. And I don't know from my perspective how to get that to happen uh, just yet, but I think that um, there's nothing like a good crisis to bring a whole change really fast um, and then to come come back and calm down and move forward from there so thank you very much for for your thoughts on that and I'll, I'll let Lisa go as well since we only have a few minutes right yep. so we've got oh sorry go ahead Tony were you going to say something no no I just Okay, good. So Lisa Kadak. Um, you had mentioned how we were sort of forced into um, almost alignment into some of these strategic plans. Like my institution has a vision 2023 and um, blended of course was um, already on the plate to be increased uh, was the vision. And so I'm just wondering like now there's a huge discussion surrounding um, the definitions of hybrid and blended. So when we do return, um, how do you see that impacting or do you see that impacting uh, the direction that those strategic plans are going? That's a very good point. Uh, I, I think definitions are going to become critically important. One of the projects I work with is the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association's annual survey. And they've come up with some definitions for online learning, um, for blended and hybrid learning. Um, and they've also come up with a definition for emote, uh, a remote emergency uh, teaching. Uh, and one of the things I think institutions are going to have to do is to come to some agreement on those definitions and actually track what's happening. Um, count how many students there are in these different classes so that when we get to 2021, we've got some idea of what the shift was from 2019 to 2021. Because otherwise, you, if you've got a plan, you've got to know where you're going. And if you if you actually don't know what your students are doing and you don't know what courses you're offering, you're going to be in trouble. So, and actually collecting this data is no trivial, trivial task. So I, I do think we need agreed definitions. Uh, you have to be a bit careful here because digital learning is expanding and evolving and changing all the time. So your definitions come out, get out of date fairly quickly. But I, I do think we need to sp speak the same language when we're talking about 
quote online learning what are we actually meaning do we mean fully online do we mean uh, some kind of blended if so what is the mix between face to face and online in terms of how much time students spend on, on each for instance um, and how many courses do we have in, in, in each of those categories um, so I, I, I think the actual tracking is going to be a challenge, but I think it's going to be very important. Okay, thank you very much. So Tony, do you see that tracking happening as becoming part of the uh, annual survey of online learning? The well, that, yes, uh, yes. I mean, we, 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 part of the research plan for the survey is to contact every, uh, vice president academic and every uh, vice president education in the colleges and to ask them to set up a task force within the institution to agree on how they're going to collect this data. Um, one of the problems we found is that from year to year we get inconsistent results from the same institution and we think that's mainly because different people each time are answering the question in different years. So. Th there's a reliability issue here, but also um, it, it's never been a requirement for institutions to do this. And I, I don't, I'm not saying government should legislate that they do it, but um, I, I think it's in the institution's own interest to be able to track what they're doing and to see how they relate to other institutions in what they're doing. Right, okay, good, thank you. Now shall we move on to our next uh, stage then? Okay, good. So, second question. Is face-to-face -face teaching inherently superior to online learning? And has COVID-19 changed this perception? I think I can answer the first question, but I haven't had a few who are actually in the front lines as to whether it actually has changed. So let me say a few comments on that before we get into the discussion. First of all, let me say you can teach well or you can teach badly, both face-to-face -face and online. The issue isn't really about delivery method, it's about teaching method and how well you teach in each. And let me give an example particularly on one which is causing huge problems in September, and that's the large first-year lecture classes. Now, obviously, if, if COVID-19 is going to be around, which we think it will be in September, you can't put 200 or more students, uh, lock them up in the same room for an hour and let them spread their germs to everybody. So, um, what, what are you going to do about that? Well, of course, the, what happened with the in emergency remote learning is that, uh, and I don't blame faculty for this, they just switched their lectures to Zoom and delivered them online. And now many of them finding that students don't like this, this is not working for them, um, and it, this is not a good way to teach. Now, the problem here isn't the fact they've gone online, the fact was that it wasn't working when it was face-to-face -face either, but it wasn't so obvious then. So it's not a problem of going online or face to face. It's a question of the, the teaching method not working very well, unless you happen to be that very rare person that uh, someone can deliver a brilliant lecture every week for 13 weeks of the year. So, so the method is the problem. And there are two problems. I, I mentioned the skills that are needed. Well, lecture classes put a terrific uh, emphasis on content presentation rather than on skills development. And the other problem, of course, is cognitive overload. How much can students concentrate? Now, when they're online, I think it's easier for faculty to see that they're not concentrating or they're not doing the things that they're uh, wanting them to do. Whereas in class, they can get away with it. They can look at their, their, their cell phones, they can just switch off psychologically and so on. So I think one of the things that's going to have to happen, um, certainly in the next year or so, they get that those big large first year lecture classes have got to be redesigned. Now, there's a fundamental issue here, and that is how to faculty are to teach those classes. Um, uh, well, it's not that we don't have enough professors, it's we, the, the professors have chosen to put their efforts more into third, fourth year and graduate classes more than into the, the large first year classes. And so I think we're going to have to redesign them into smaller sections purely for COVID-19 reasons. Um, with some online learning, maybe blended learning, and much more active learning built into the design of the courses, whether, whether the active learning is online or, or while they're on campus. And the other issue is that there's um, st different students have different needs. I have two, two grandsons this year who are in graduating from high school, and they're desperate for the face-to-face -face, uh, interaction on campus with other students of the same age and so on. They're both taking a year off. They're not going to do online classes in their first year. They're going to take, take a gap year and come back, um, hopefully, when, when things are different. Whereas I guess most of the students taking this course, you, you must prefer online learning because you're working, you've got families, and you have very different needs from those first-year students. So it's, it's not so much the content that matters here, it, it's the needs of the students that matter about whether they should be online or face-to-face. -face. And, uh, and also significantly, are the learning different learning goals? Some things can be done much better online, and some things can be much better done face-to-face. -face. And it's actually identifying those, those differences. Um, and I want to say a little bit more about that. We don't have a good theory for deciding what should be best taught online and, and what should be best taught face-to-face. I don't think we can accept the bland statement that face-to-face -face teaching is always better. We have so many, so much research and so many instances where that's just not true. We find that if if it's designed well, online learning can do many things as well as, as it or, or better than face-to-face -face teaching. But what are what are those circumstances and context? We, it's very hard to define that. It probably varies very much from subject area to subject area. But what we need are some criteria or models for deciding what should be done face to face and what should be done online. And ironically, if you think of face to face teaching as just one medium, 
and on uh, the internet and uh, video and audio as other media, what are the affordances of face-to-face -face teaching that differentiate it from, um, from online teaching? Now, I think there are good answers to that question, but every instructor should really sit down and think very carefully about in their subject area, what is it that really is better done face-to-face -face and could not be done online? And the other thing that comes out of this is if it's really the students as much as the content that differentiates whether we should be online or not, could we design the same course in multiple modes so students could, take, could choose how they take it? Could they take a course fully online if they wanted to? Could they take the same course with the same exam fully face to face if they wanted to? Or could they also take it in a, in a blended or hybrid mode if they are say working part time um, but want to come to campus when they can? Um, I don't think it's impossible or even difficult to design something in multiple modes. Once you put it online, then it's much easy to easy. It's much easier then to offer it in, in an alternative formats. And the other thing that's going to happen is we're going to have to look at our campuses. COVID nineteen is going to cause lots of problems, even for the face-to-face um, -face teaching. How do you do active learning when you've got face-to-face -face teaching? This is a bigger problem even for um, schools. So how do you keep that physical distance uh, with COVID-19 when students are on campus? But there's a bigger question under that, and that is, what should our teaching spaces look like when students can do a lot of stuff online? I, I'm hearing that some students are going to school and actually getting their courses online through headphones while they're in class, which seems, you know, rather odd to me. So I. Uh, how do you get the affordances of face-to-face -face teaching when they're in school um, um, rather than just replacing what they would do at home by doing it at school? And what would those spaces look like? Uh, I've got a couple of examples here of um, classrooms that integrate technology with face-to-face -face teaching. Um, most of these are based on things like experiential learning, uh, collaborative learning and so on. So it's the teaching method that's driving the classroom space. Uh, I went to one institution in British Columbia recently where every classroom had a notice from facility saying, please put the desks back in, in rows. So what we've got is the janitor setting the pedagogy for the teaching here. Um, and immediately the instructors come in and have to move all the tables around to get that kind of group teaching and so on. So, so the classroom space, we're going to have to really think about that in the future. So what I think too is when we get back into campus, most students will use online learning irrespective of the instructors tell them. Um, students are already going online to look stuff up, uh, topics on, on Google. My One of my grandsons told me that he only goes to one lecture in three, and he said two of his friends go to the other two. What they do, they, it's a terrible lecture, he's doing physics. They, they can't follow the lectures, they can understand the topics. So they make a list of the topics, send an email to each of the other two, and then they all go and look it up on Google. And he's, he's saying, I find MIT Open Courseware the best because I, I can actually understand their lectures. So students are going to do this anyway. And many faculty will realize that online learning can be very useful when used in conjunction with face to face teaching. So I think maybe less up to a third will change their teaching methods as a result of doing some online learning because of COVID 19 without any intervention. They'll just see. Yeah, this, a lot of this makes sense, and I, but I, not doing it the old way, I'll have to redesign, but I can teach better by combining online with face-to-face -face teaching. But also, many more faculty will have received some training. Um, one institution I'm working with now is trying to get every faculty member through at least one half-hour module um, on blended learning, how to teach in a blended learning format, before September in the whole, getting through the whole institution. So whether faculty like it or not, some of them are going to get exposed to new teaching methods as a result. So more faculty will receive training.
But overall, I think one of the major implications of COVID-19 is that online learning will become more integrated into the regular teaching of, of, of every instructor and faculty member. It won't be considered as something separate. So over to you. Is face-to-face -face teaching inherently superior to online learning? And particularly over to you, in your view, has COVID-19 changed its perception? Excellent, thanks, Tony. <clears throat> and so Earl, I see you've got your hand up, but before we do that, let's just look at the chat for a second, then I'll come back to you, Earl. So there was the one question about, um, we can't just take face-to-face -face instruction and transpose it into an online learning environment. No, I, so I, comment I, on. I, I agree with that, of course. Um, what, it, it's interesting that um, we put all instructional design efforts in the past, mainly into online learning. We have a model built on instructional design, built on clearly identifying learning outcomes, clearly structuring uh, the work that students do to uh, make sure that uh, they're not overloaded, for instance, to make sure mm -hmm. that there are activities built in and so on. Um, I, I think that's going to have to come now more and more into face-to-face -face teaching. I think just the idea of a professor particularly turning up uh, the, or maybe doing stuff overnight before they do a presentation in the morning, um, I think that's going to have to change and it will mm -hmm. change. Right. So Tal is asking about collaborative learning. Is it something different in online education? Well, there are good models for collaborative learning. Um, there's Linda Harrison's model, um, and there's also the communities uh, of inquiry model uh, from, mm -hmm. so, so we have some good models for how to develop collaborative learning online. I don't, I, again, it's not the, the, it's not the mode of delivery that matters here, it's how you do it. And you, you can do collaborative learning just as well online by putting students into groups, setting tasks for them, and they can work either um, offline or online and come back in um, with that collaborative learning. And it can be done synchronously through Zoom and so on, or it can be done asynchronously through mm -hmm. online discussion forums or even social media. So I, I don't see there's any issue here again. The, you know, one of the things that I realized when I was writing my book, I, I started off having a, a group of teaching methods that were face to face and another group of teaching methods that were online. And then I realized, in fact, it didn't make any sense. You could do both. All, all the teaching methods could be done either way. We're, we're just talking about a, a method of delivery here, not a method mm -hmm. of teaching. Mm -hmm. Right. OK, thanks for that. I'll, I'll, I'll pick one more from the chat here and I can't bring everything in just due to time. Then Earl will get back to your question. And Christina asks uh, or comments, I've noticed in my role that COVID-19 has expedited conver uh, conversion expectations, panic response to timelines of moving curriculum online. And I think that's something obviously we're seeing a lot of is this rapid pivot as it's been called. Um, what are you seeing as some of the effects of that uh, and, and how will that play out in the longer term in terms of compared with a, a planned rational strategic approach to developing online learning? Well, I think there's obviously going to be a lot of negativity as a result. And let me say, first of all, I don't blame any instructor or teacher uh, who had to do things very, very quickly with, in some mm -hmm. cases, less than a week uh, to, to move something which they'd never even thought about doing uh, to, um, and, and suddenly making it work. So, so that, that's not the criticism. Now, I, I, I might not be so... Um, sympathetic in September because there's been a, a fair amount of time to actually uh, begin to think about what we've been doing and actually improve that. So, but a lot of, a lot of instructors will have found that it just hasn't worked for them. And so will students, not because uh, it was online, but because it was bad teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the opportunity here is to learn from that and try to do better in September. Um, so I, I think you, you have to be very careful that you separate out the, the mode of delivery from the teaching method and mm -hmm. say that we've got 20 years of research into what works online and what doesn't, and you haven't been using best practice. It's like, you know, putting somebody in a car who's not had any, um, 
uh, experience of driving. They might have ridden a bike, but that's not going to get help them very much when they're driving a car. So, it, yeah, it's a means of transport, but it's uh, <laughs> you've got to learn something different. Um, yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much for that. And Earl, do you want to uh, put out your question? Hi, Tony. <clears throat> um, what interests me in this conversation is I'm an Indigenous uh, educator. Um, I teach, um, I've taught in Indigenous classrooms for 15 to 20 years, and I'm a director of a, of a First Nations Indigenous um, uh, organization which has online uh, virtual learning classrooms we have now. They used to be face-to-face. -face. Uh, when COVID hit, we, we uh, pivoted quickly to Zoom, and I agree totally with your statement that Zoom uh, is a poor replacement for face-to-face. -face. It's not the same, nor is it an online experience. What I'm interested um, and what I've found interesting in my kind of studies and my experience is that um, I really bring the cultural and the, uh, the somatic and uh, embodied uh, type of learning experience in my classrooms. That's really important, important to me. And, to, and that, that knowledge can be experienced in different ways. And I think in this conversation of virtual versus face-to-face, I find that it's really, uh, it's, it is about the quality of the instruction, yes, but it's also about uh, the worldview. My worldview is that uh, a lot of knowledge really is, um, uh, in a, is, is transferred in a somatic way uh, where, where the body does um, play a part in it and culture plays a part in it. So I found, I've tried to build that into my online courses with varying success i'm going through iterations right now but i'm just getting your i'm just in that conversation of virtual versus face to face i think there's still an opportunity to think of more than just a cognitive experience which is what learning is defined as mostly you're absolutely right Earl. and in fact i haven't yet seen what i would call uh an online design that really reflects the culture and ways of learning of indigenous people and that's got to come from you basically it can't come from outside um and there may be things that can't be done uh, that that are fundamental to your worldview online and i i'm not one who believes that online learning can replace all face-to-face -face teaching i i'm much what i'm really interested in Earl, is can you define what those um uh, affordances are of the way that you learn that just don't lend themselves to being done online and or w are, are there ways in which they could be done online but we'd have to design it very differently and uh, so I, I think you're absolutely right there are big cultural issues in online learning um, I've taught courses internationally with students in China and in uh, Mexico for instance and the Mexican students responded very differently than the Chinese students did and again you, you, I don't want to overgeneralize here because when you talk about Chinese students they vary enormously within themselves as well but there were definitely cultural differences here and some some of the Chinese students in particular find it very difficult to post uh, written comments that might be construed as being critical of the instructor for instance uh, and the Mexicans didn't have any problem with that but they tended to go off in all directions rather than focus on the topics so, so there, there, there were these cultural differences and I had to learn as an instructor to accommodate th these cultural differences and to redesign my teaching to take account of them and I think we have to do that with indigenous education as well Thank you. I appreciate that. It's, um, I definitely see, I'm trying right now to build in this new virtual classroom, uh, a different worldview, and I'm finding it um, challenging. It's definitely a work in progress for myself. Thanks for coming in tonight. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thanks for that great discussion. So now let's move on to the third question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh, this is an easy. This is an easy one for everyone. Uh, what new technologies are most likely to impact on online learning over the next few year, five years, and why? I think it's the why that I'm interested in here. I mean, what we've got is uh, now we have a fantastic range of choice in technologies. Um, so we have more choice, 
but probably less discrimination in how we're using them. Um, um, you know, we've got Zoom. Well, Zoom isn't a new technology as such, but it, it's just an improvement actually over Adobe Connect, for instance, uh, I, I believe. So, so it's, it's what I would call not a, a, a quantum leap, uh, not, not a paradigm shift. It's just improved on a, a traditional uh, video, video conferencing method. Then we have podcasts, we have mobile apps. I've got one here from UBC and they're some sciences where um, students go out, they have a map and they can overlay uh, um, the map on, on, on them, uh, they have the map on their phone and overlaid on that, they collect data and they insert the data about the soil they're collecting and the map interacts with, with, with the data that they're putting in, for instance. Um, and there's lots of apps like that on mobile phones that can be used for teaching purposes. That that, that was based incidentally on a on a Quest uh, app um, like um, um, Pokemon, for instance. Just adapted, um, didn't have to build it from scratch. Then we got remote proctoring, um, ways of doing exams remotely, where uh, which attempt to avoid cheating. Um, and then we have YouTube and Vimeo videos, um, often very high quality, four or five minute videos on, on a topic. We have simulations and games. We have augmented and virtual reality and we have learning analytics and artificial intelligence. So we have all these technologies to choose from, but we don't have very good ways to discriminate between them. So people kind of jump on a bandwagon like we did, everyone did with Zoom. Uh, without really thinking, it's not the technology that matters, it's how you're going to use it. So what are the tools we can have for making better choices of, our, um, of, our techno of the technology that's available to us? And again, I think we need a theory or a model for media choice. And in my book, I, I provide two. One is my own called Sections, um, based on... Um, a set of steps you go through looking at whether that technology will work best for you in your particular learning context. And also um, Quintadura's SAMA model, um, <clears throat> which looks at whether it transforms the teaching or not, or the extent to which it transforms teaching. <clears throat> and they're useful um, as far as they go, but they're not well known. They're not often used by, by people when making decisions. Um, and maybe we need better ones. And in particular, we have this argument about synchronous and asynchronous now. What's best done synchronously and what's best done asynchronously? And you, you, know, you can think of a, a, a four-way axis here where you, you know, what's best done synchronously online and what's best done asynchronously online and what's best done synchronously face-to-face -face, and what's best done asynchronously face-to-face. And then with the technologies, we have access and equity issues. Um, you'll see on the right, this is from um, the, I always forget the name of it, it's the Canadian Radio and Television Commission. Uh, how, what CID? phones have, um, have internet access and at what bandwidth and at what speeds? In, in Canada, you know, 85, 86% of homes have um, access. It's the other 15% that we have to worry about. No many rural and remote communities and they're often uh, in income related as well. So uh, low income people not only have higher cost, have less access, but they have higher costs in accessing as well. So there are obviously some equity issues here still with online learning, even in Canada. Um, and then there's a question of who decides what technology should be used. I mentioned my grandson, they're going off and looking stuff up in Google and so on. They're deciding what technologies they want to use for learning. Um, but also instructors are doing that. And then we have IT departments who, uh, we've, we used to have LMS wars where, you know, uh, instructors would want one learning management system and the IT department would want another one and so on. So. What is the decision-making structure here? Who should decide? Should anybody be allowed to decide what technology to use? And if so, what are the equity issues if that happens? 
And then do we need a law of simplicity? You know, the, the easier the technology and the more accessible it is, the more we should be using that technology. And more complicated and more expensive and more restrictive a technology is, perhaps that's the less we should be using it. So what are the implications of this wide range of choice? Um, well, first of all, how do we advise instructors? Do we provide more training, uh, more self-help modules to help them choose? What models should we use? Um, can we link these um, decisions to outcomes and skills? Can we, for instance, will virtual reality enable you to do things, teach, teach skills that would be almost impossible to teach without them. Um, I think we've seen some examples of that um, emerging. And a governance model, uh, this is from another book I wrote called Managing Technology, where basically decisions are, um, about technology need to be made right throughout an organization, from students right through to the board of governors. Um, but it's working out what level of decision should be taken. Um, uh, who should make the decision about what technology at a course level should, should be used or at a program level? For, uh, for, for instance, with online learning, at what stage should you be moving or switching or changing from largely face-to-face -face delivery in the first years perhaps of the program uh, to mainly online maybe in the last year and so on? Who should make that decision? Um, and lastly, okay, here's my prediction. I think Zoom will go on um, being very popular for the simple reason that faculty and instructors don't have to change anything. They can go on using it. They might get better at using it. Um, they might shorten their lectures and so on, but they're going to go on using Zoom, I think. I think that we'll see um, an increasing use of serious games. Uh, why? Because I think you can teach a lot of those high level intellectual skills like problem solving, creativity, collaborative learning and so on um, through serious games and they're fun, they're motivating and they needn't detract from the academic integrity of a program if they're well designed. And we are now getting some design models for serious games that combine the educational with the fun aspects of games. And then I, I certainly see a role for immersive technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality. They'll have niche roles. They won't be like a learning management system or Zoom used across every subject, <laughs> but they'll be used very selectively for um, doing things that are very hard to do or are much better done through, th through these technologies than in, in real life. And I see them particularly as acting as a bridge from theory to practice where the practice is often very difficult uh, in the real world or very dangerous um, and where you want to get shorten that training time you can't use real things like people uh, in nursing or uh, real real planes when people are flying and so on you can shorten that training gap by using those immersive technologies and I, lastly, I, I want to say something about artificial intelligence. I've just edited an edition on artificial intelligence in higher education in a journal. Frankly, there's nothing happening that's really interesting at the moment. Um, be quite blunt, there's a lot of hype and very little real um, change. But artificial intelligence is a sleeping giant. It's not going to come through its use through universities and colleges. It's used for teaching and education is going to come from the big tech companies. They're the ones who will basically bypass the educational system if we're not careful. So I think artificial intelligence remains a threat, even though there's not much there at the moment. So discussion, we're almost at the end. What new technologies are most likely to impact on online learning over the next five years and why? Okay, thanks for that, Tony. And there are a lot of big issues there, so the floor is open for questions or comments. And while questions are being formulated, Tony, maybe you could talk a little bit about what are some of the implications of the big platform companies uh, kind of jumping over the education system? Uh, so what are some of the uh, challenges that you see uh, coming along with that? Well, I think the challenge for the big tech companies is the business model. How do they make money? 
mm -hmm. on this. Um, um, what I see happening is, uh, particularly in in lifelong and continuing education, that's already happening, that you're gonna get qualifications from companies like LinkedIn, LinkedIn Learning. Um, they can combine uh, all their information about the skills that businesses need through all the job efforts that go through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, they can uh, build their own teaching or contract in teaching from outside and they can have enough mass data from uh, users of their services to be able to build models that actually learn um, and improve their teaching effectiveness. Very mm -hmm. much like the way that Google Translate has got better and better by learning through getting people to correct bad translations and so on. And it learns from that. And I, I can see that happening, particularly in the vocational and technical areas. Um, maybe not so much in the uh, the, the the higher skills levels, um, and I think they'll just bypass the education system because they can go to massive numbers, and that's where their business model lies. Um, I think the danger, of course, is that we we will lose control of education. We lose control of um, uh, of uh, of the knowledge bases, it will mm -hmm. all be sucked up by the, the big uh, tech companies. Um, and I think for, for, for democracy, that will be very bad. Mm -hmm. Huge issue, and we've talked a lot about that in the course here too. Um, I see Christ Christina is mentioning military applications, and Christina, I know you do military simulations. Uh, are you, do you have any question or comments or thoughts? Oh, we just lost you. Yeah, the military are off. Sure are often ahead in, in, in the use of technology for teaching. I mean, instructional design came out of the Second World War, came out of systems thinking, um, going back to the uh, Normandy landings, which needed a huge amount of pre-planning and coordination. Um, the same way of thinking led to the kind of ADDIE model and so on. So um, I, I, I understand the overhead projector actually originated as a, in the military. Um, and then was picked up by industry and eventually by education. So, yes, I, I and they have the money too. I mean, if I, I, I'd be very surprised if the Chinese government isn't putting a lot of money into artificial intelligence for its military applications and also for training its soldiers because they got millions of soldiers. Right. Sanjay, go ahead, please. I was going to say one other technology that that might be. Um coming up would be um, like virtual machines. And uh, we use them now like for COVID-19 for our animation program because the program requires such high use software for, you know, design and rendering um, and you need high end machines for them. So students, because they cost thousands and thousands of dollars to use those softwares and, and the machines, students can now access them, the machines online through a virtual machine. So they're not, so they're, they're using the physical machine, but virtually. And so they can do all of their design work with the, the high-end software and, and using the high-end machines, but from their home, from their laptops. But it does require like a, a broadband um, connection, but that's another technology that might allow students to, you know, access like a, an animation 3D program without having to actually buy the software and buy um, like, cause each workstation, um, it costs about $4,000 to, to, um, yeah. to make. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, Sanjay. I, I think there's two things that will drive down the cost of simulations and virtual reality. Uh, one is what I would call building blocks that, you know, standard pieces of code that you need to create stuff um, uh, then becoming widely accessible through the cloud, either commercially or as an open ac uh, open access, and also open access itself. Um, uh, it's very high cost to create, say, um, a simulation uh, that requires huge amounts of data, but once you've written the software for that application, then you can make it available as open education resource, and then anybody can build their own models using that basic uh, platform and so on. So, and that's already happened. Uh, 
there's um, in my book there's an example of molecular chemistry um, which uh, uses very large amounts of computing power but uh, once once they created it uh, the um, professor made it available as open education resource so that anybody teaching chemistry could use that virtual reality platform um, by downloading it through the cloud for instance so uh, I think you're absolutely right I think the cost Will come, will continue to come down in both simulations and in virtual reality. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of our time. We could do one quick final question if anybody wants to pop one in. Okay, I'll just pick something from Lisa here. Hottest debate at my institution currently is sync versus async, so synchronous versus asynchronous learning. Tony, any quick thoughts on that debate? Yeah, it's not either or. I think there's a role for both. And again, it's a question of sitting down and working out what the affordances of each are. Um, uh, I, I mean, most online learning until quite recently has been asynchronous, mm -hmm. but with the role of, with the um, development of uh, video streaming and uh, video conferencing, um, a lot of new online learning has gone back to being synchronous. Now, again, it's a question then of working out what's best done synchronously online and what's best done asynchronously. Uh, and again, I, th I think, for instance, there's value in synchronous discussion with students and there's value in asynchronous discussion. So it, again, it, it's working out, may maybe you do both. You, maybe you have redundancy in the system. Some students will prefer one, some will prefer another. Hmm. Um, and, but there may be things that are better done synchronously, um, like thinking on your feet and debating, and others that are better done asynchronously, like collaboratively, collaboratively writing a paper where you can think before you write. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that's it. Uh, we've wrapped up an hour that went very, very quickly. I'd like to say a huge thanks to you, Tony, for coming in and sharing your uh, insights and your knowledge and your experience. I'd like to thank all the uh, student participants in the course for participating with really good uh, questions and thoughts and, and comments. And there's a lot to think about, and we'll certainly debrief some of that uh, over the next week. We are close to the end of the course, uh, but um, I'm sure we uh, will pull some things out of here. And I'm, it's funny because the comments in the discussion here, Tony, that you had, as well as uh, in the chat here, it all just goes ping, ping, ping to all the different topics that uh, our core students are doing, as well as the teamwork. It's all very, very well connected. So. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good week and um, all the best to everybody.